okay, now we've got Nathan that's going to be with a hydrologist with the U.S. Geological Survey, Nebraska Water Science Center of Lincoln. He's a contributor to the report entitled Suitability of River Delta Sediment as Propane. Missouri and Niagara Rivers, Nebraska and South Dakota, 2015. All right, thank you. Yeah, as you mentioned, I'm a hydrologist with the USGS, the Nebraska Water Science Center. We're based out of Lincoln. Um, and so uh, this study came about as part of a uh, Midwest region initiative to look at natural sources of frac sand, um, uh, just to get an idea of what's out there and what, what might be possible when it comes to uh, finding new sources, because at the time, um, I think this initiative started in 2014. Uh, the fracking was in full swing, and um, they're wondering, you know, where's all this sand going to come from? And so that's just a little bit of background of uh, why we started this study. So then we get to what you guys are all here today: is is the sediment that's causing such a problem? Is it possible that it could be used? Uh, in the frack industry? Well, there's a couple things to consider. Uh, one, uh, do we have a large supply of it? Uh, yeah, you can go out and look, and uh, I think you can understand that. Um, I mean, we've got about 5 million tons that are coming in annually, so we've got a lot of sediment that's piling up out there. Secondly, are we near fracking operations? Well. Some of the largest fracking operations in the country are in the Bakken Formation up in North Dakota. So, yeah, theoretically, we're, we're pretty close. We're not directly right there, but um, it's definitely doable. Um, then we get to uh, one thing that you might not consider, which is uh, rail transport access. Um, a lot of the sands that are brought in uh, to the different uh, fracking zones are brought in by rail, and so do we have rail, direct rail access? Well, currently, no, we don't. Not, not right along the river. We have some old, there are some old river, uh, railroad lines near the river uh, that could be rehabilitated, but that's another cost that would have to be considered. And then the, the question that I'm going to deal most with today uh, is the sediment that's w within our delta. Is it of frac sand quality? Is it good enough that it could be used in the industry. And so that's what I'm going to spend most of this talk uh, discussing. So for those that uh, don't have much of a background in fracking, so fracking is just a term that refers to the fracturing of a, a geologic formation that uh, holds oil and gas. And what they do is they'll do directional drilling. So you drill horizontally and you break up uh, with pressurized fluid, generally with some chemicals and water, um, you break up the rock and the fractures uh, release the oil and the gas. Well, to, to keep those fractures open, you need some, some kind of material. And that's where the what we call propent, for propping those fractures open, comes in. And so if I say frac sand or propent, they're kind of inter interchangeable. Um, there might be somebody out there that might think that's not wise, but that's what I'm going to do for this talk specifically. Um, so there's a few different kinds of propent. There's natural, which is just uh, <laughs> naturally occurring sand. A lot of times it's from sandstones. Um, and then we have engineered propent, which is made from ceramic material. Uh, and then we also have uh, resin-coated sands. Um, and one of those sources is actually already being used uh, from the you, Anybody that's from Nebraska is probably familiar with the Loop River Power Canal. Well, if you've driven past there, you've seen their giant piles of sand. Well, uh, in recent years, they've marketed some of that for the resin-coated sand. And these are sands that, on their own, they're not strong enough to handle the pressures that are required. But with some additional resin, they can still be used for that. And so it's still marketable. So this is a graph uh, showing how the frac sand industry has uh, developed over time. You can see a large increase between 2005 and 2012. Um, and actually, I just did a little 
background research uh, and a few resources I found said this is, so this shows about 30 million metric tons sold in 2012. According to what I read in uh, 2017, that was up to 80 million metric tons. So it's over doubled from what it was in 2012. So we're using a lot of sand is what I'm getting at. <laughs> um, so what are you looking for for a frac sand? What are the optimal properties? Um, well, what we look at when we're, when we're talking about the creme de la creme, um, most people think of the Ottawa or the northern white sand, which comes from a large area of sandstones in uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota. That's where the primary source of uh, the premium frac sand comes from. And what you want is a high quartz content. Um, the quart the uh, sand that they get out of there is generally about 99% quartz or higher. Um, but if you don't have that, you at least need about a 90, 95 or above silica content. Quartz is a type of, of silica. And so if you, uh, if you at least have it mostly silica, that's, that's good. But the better quart, the higher quartz content, the better. Um, so related to that is the hardness. You need something that can handle the pressure. Uh, when, you, when you're putting that fluid in the rock, it's creating a lot of pressure. And so if you're... If the formation is large, large formation, you're going to have all kind of pressure from the oil and the gas as well. Um, and then you're looking at the size of the grains. You want them to be spherical and rounded is preferred. And then uh, another thing, so when it comes to, there's different types of uh, fracking industry. You can be fracking for oil, or you can be fracking for natural gas, and actually, both of those require different types of frac sand. For your petroleum, they're generally looking for a coarser grain material. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about those different sizes in a little bit. And then, but for your natural gas, you're looking to your fine to medium grained um, size material. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of the frac sand uh, is taken from Wisconsin and Minnesota, um, and a little bit of Northern Illinois. But with the additional, uh, there's lots of more mining of natural gas going on again in uh, Oklahoma and Texas. So a lot of regional sources are being used. So anything that's close by that's of at least reasonable frac sand quality. So those are, uh, there's lots of other ones as well, but those are kind of the main ones. Um, the resin sands at the time of the report, there were just two being used. There may be more now, but um, from some river sands in Arkansas, and then those loop river sands that I'm talking about from here in Nebraska. Or actually, we're not in Nebraska, are we? <laughs> just, just over the river there. Um, and so, where is all that sand coming from? Well, for those that aren't familiar with the loop river, it drains a large portion of the area, the ecological area that we call the sand hills in Nebraska. When it's called the sand hills, there's probably going to be some sand there, right? Um, and so we've got a lot of sand coming into the loop, but the Niobrara drains a lot of that same area. So theoretically, the sands that are coming in the loop and the sands in the Niobrara are going to be somewhat similar. It might not be exactly the same, but it's, it's draining a lot of the same material. And this map is kind of hard to read. But, so the Loop River, for those that aren't familiar with the area, is right here. And there's a, di a couple different branches of it that flow out of the sand hills. And there's, this is the Niobrara that feeds into where we are over here. All right, so what were, what were we doing with, with this particular study? Well, along with trying to figure out if this sand was of frac sand quality, um, this was the first of... of what we think might be many different USGS studies in different areas around the country. So we wanted to try some different methods, see what works, see what we can improve upon the next time around, and that kind of thing. So that was one of the, because uh, uh, we started out with kind of a small amount of funding, and so we're kind of going through the basics and trying to figure out what's going to work best. But then, like I said, what we're talking about here is is the sand of, of uh, of good enough quality to be marketed. And then we also wanted to compare the, the sand that's in the delta with the sand that's in the Niobrara itself. 
Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how we collected some uh, sand samples on the Niobrara as well. So this was our study reach. Um, we focused in on three and a half kilometers just uh, based on resources, resources and uh, this is a part of the um, Missouri that's managed by the Corps, so um, theoretically this would be a place that might be dredged. So that was another reason. We also I want to point out that um, with the equipment we were using, we focused on places of bare sand. Um, this was uh, not too far after um, uh, this. We we collected the data or our samples in March, and so generally the flows are higher. The Phragmites are not there, obviously, because it's it hasn't had, they haven't had time to come in. But even even in March, there were some pretty heavily vegetated areas we couldn't get to. So um, our samples are are kind of biased in that way that they focused on areas that we could get to with the equipment we had. I just want to make you aware of that. And so what we did was we, um, and so this is the Chief Standing Bear Bridge. So those that are familiar with the area will recognize this. And then, so there are four main bar complexes that we called A, B, C, and D. And those yellow lines there, um, I'm going to talk about it in a second, but those are the uh, the areas that we are measuring resistivity to de to determine where we're going to collect samples. So as I was just saying, um, so we we collected these resistivity profiles. You'll see the the picture in the bottom there is a picture of an ATV that's dragging behind a cable that has a, that has these resistivity. Uh, instruments on it that's measuring the resistivity in the subsurface and what that tells us is uh, what kind of material is below us. Um, and as I mentioned this was this data was all collected in March in March of 2015. Um, and so here's a little schematic of how it works. So as you're driving along it's shooting down to the subsurface and getting these resistivity uh, readings back. It's kind of hard to see this text over here, but so these, uh, so these, uh, the blues down here, they're going to be your clays and your silts. So you're not going to want to target those because we're more interested in the sand. So if you can uh, once we looked at our profile, we avoided places like this that had large clay and silts. And then you, as you go, as a higher resistivity, you get into coarser grains. So you got your fine sand, your medium sand, and your coarse sand. So we use the, this data to base where we're going to collect our sample cores. All right, so these black, the black dots there, those are where the cores were actually collected. Um, we, based on the resistivity profiles, we selected 28 locations. But when we went there in March, there were three of them that were inundated with water, and uh, it was not possible to sample those. All right, so this is the, a picture of the equipment that we used to collect the cores. It's called a geoprobe. It's basically um, a core drill on the back of a tractor. So you go along the sandbar, and you go to your location, and you collect a core. Um, each core was 12 feet in length, and that was based on, that was about roughly uh, what the depth of sediment in that area has accumulated since the dam was put in. So we tried to just test the sediment, the, the new sediment since 55. And then here's where we, I, I told you we collected some data on the Niobrara as well. Um, so up here we have Spencer Dam, and we collected six samples um, with a little bit different method, which I'm going to talk about in a second, um, within the impoundment area of the dam. And then we had uh, three study reaches, one just downstream of the dam we called reach A, reach B, and then reach C, and then one reach D way down towards uh, the confluence with the Missouri. And we put more samples towards closer to the dam in the assumption that the uh, a lot of that sediment that's coming, uh, those that aren't familiar with how Spencer Dam works is they flush the sediment uh, once or tw generally twice a year in the fall and the spring. 
And so a lot of that sediment's gonna fall out close to the dam, so we wanted to focus a lot of the sampling closer to the dam. So this is how we collected the samples that were on the Niobrara River. We used a hand core. So the cores were only two to three feet in length. We didn't do really deep cores like we did on the Delta. Um, and again, anybody that's never been to Spencer Dam, this is what the impoundment area is. It's kind of like a micro scale of what we see here um, because it fills in with sediment and they have to flush that out um, once it accumulates. And so when we're collecting the sediment on the main stem, um, along with that core, we would go to sandbars that were uh, above the water surface, and we would scrape off about three feet generally and try to get a nice column of sand, and we'd bag it up, and that's how we collected a lot of the, a lot of the samples of the sandbars on the Niobrara. Here's a picture of one of the cores from the Delta. Um, so what we would do is we would bring it in and we would split it, split it open and uh, visually analyze it. And the main thing I want you to take away from this is the samples that we actually sent in for analysis targeted the areas of, that seemed like pretty homogeneous sized sand. Um, you would see little clay lenses like this and we would avoid those. So I want you to understand that like when I talk about the sample data, that's from the sand that we targeted that we thought would be good prop in sand. So there's material in here that wasn't tested. Um, sometimes there were gravels or whatever like that, but um, I just want that to be highlighted. So we sent in a total of 106 samples for lab testing. Um, but only, t um, like I said, we were kind of resource limited for this project. So uh, for the Mineralogy analysis, we only were able to send 12 of those in. Um, these were done at a USGS lab. Um, and so you can see the quartz content is pr not quite as high as, as you would like to see. Um, generally, it was around the 70% amount. Um, the, the labels uh, down here. So the, the NR, those are ones from the Niobrara River. These are SP means Spencer Dam, um, and then these are the different bar complexes on the delta. So A, A was the most upstream, D the most downstream. So they're pretty similar, although that D one had really low uh, quartz. But like I said, there's only 12 samples, so um, I think the thing to, gen to take away generally is this is the sand does not have as high of a percent as we would like, but they all had 95% silicate. So it's still possible that they could be used for like the resin coated sands or that kind of, that kind of thing. Um, and then those 106 samples, we sent them to Montana Tech that has a propent laboratory. Um, and we tested them for crush resistance, uh, for the grain size analysis, uh, the sphericity and the roundness. So looking at roundness and sphericity, when, uh, when the American Petroleum Institute is looking at what qualifies as a decent frac sand, they want at least a minimum of 0.6 sphericity and 0.6 roundness. Well, all our samples were above that, so that was good. Now, um, there are some, depending on what you're doing, um, some in the industry require a 0.7 for the, uh, for the sphericity and uh, or, uh, yeah, and uh, none of ours were <coughs> quite, or I take that back, the roundness. So some of ours were above that 0.7 for roundness, but uh, we had quite a few that were not. So it probably still would not be that premium frac sand, but it meets the minimum criteria. What is the premium uh, The 0.7, if it's about 0.7, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and so this is, this is a graph of our grain sizes. Um, so the 70, 140, this is, this is a grade that the petroleum is, this, uh, AP, API uses. Um, and that's just this, 
the smallest grain that they use for frac sand. So this would be the sand that would be used for natural gas. Um, you're not going to see this used a lot for the petroleum. Um, and so most of our samples were in this 4070, which is a medium sand, which is which is good because that um, that could be used for natural gas or petroleum. It's generally more in the natural gas area, but um, based on things I've looked at recently, the 7140 is in a lot higher demand just because there's a lot more natural gas work going on than there is petroleum. But when we started this report, it was the exact opposite. So four years ago, uh, the petroleum type sands were in more high demand. So I don't want you to take too much stock in that, although just to know like most, the main thing is we have a lot of medium sand and some fine sand, not a whole lot of coarse sand. Um, and you say this, so both the Delta and the Niobrara were pretty similar in that regard. Um, there's a little more fine sand in the Niobrara River. A lot of this came from Reach B, which was a little bit downstream. So Reach A was the reach that was closest to the dam. If you go a little bit further down to Reach B, that's where a lot of these fine sands, which makes sense when you're flushing the dam, the coarse stuff is gonna fall out first, and then some of the fines are gonna travel down further. So that, that Reach B area, if, if you decide to target your fine sands, that would be the place you would probably wanna go. When you say to the dam, you mean the Spencer? Spencer Dam, correct, sorry, I should point that out, yes. What? Uh, N is 100, 106 is the number of samples that we sent in. That's just the number of samples, sorry. Right, right. Yeah, and so this, this graph is sorted into fine to coarse. So that 7140, that's the finest size. The, what? Well, it really depends what you're wanting to use it for. But the 40 to 70 is pretty good because both industries use it. Um, like I said, it, it seems like it fluctuates, though, from year to year what they're interested in. What I was looking at the last few days said that finer sand is the sand that's in highest demand. So, but like I said, four years ago was the coarse sand that we don't even have hardly any coarse sand that coarser than 40, and that was in the highest demand. So, so it just depends. Um, so, I'll talk a little about the, uh, how they test for the strength. So, what they do is they put the, they test the sand under 5,000 pounds per square inch and see how much of that sand turns to your fine material, which is less than sand size, because you want to know if it's pressurized, is that sand just going to disintegrate? And if it's going to disintegrate, then it's not going to work. Um, but I want to also point out that, that the 10%, you don't want uh, more than 10% turning of fines, but that's the minimum criteria. For different sizes, a lot of the industry wants the even more stringent. So that 4070 that we looked at, a lot, of, a lot of industry wants to see that only 8% is turned into fines. And then you get down to the even finer size, they want to see 6%. Now, for this study, we didn't have the resources to do more than just the minimum. So what I'm gonna just show you is that they passed the 10%. Um, but if you wanted to get more of that, uh, get a better, well, it also depends on who's buying it. But um, I'll just go into the data really quick. So of the sands that were tested for strength, um, the finer sands perform pretty well. Now again, um, they were only tested to that 10%. Um, if you go to the 6%, it might not be quite as good. And also, um, when the petroleum industry tests sands, what they'll do is they'll get all the sand that's in that, uh, sand, uh, that size category down to, so everything else is only a 5.5% mix, so you have like 95% of that one size. For these tests, it was just more of the uh, raw material, and so it was harder to tell um, how much of that was due to having different sizes, the coarse grains that might have been weaker, and so those might have uh, impacted our results a little bit. Um, but 
I guess just to say that I think the crush resistance test would be be better uh, to do a, uh, a lot more of those to get a better idea of that part of it. Um, but the general idea here is um, it was they tested okay. Um, the 40 to 70, less than 50% though passed that 10%, so that doesn't look that great. Um, but it's similar to it's similar to what you saw, what we see. Uh, we actually tested two of the Loop River um, samples that the power canal sends in, and they tested about the same. So um, I, that's probably the the best comparison to put it. In. Um, one cool thing, though, is that that fine sand that was in the Niobrara, all, we only did, I think we sent in, uh, we didn't send a ton of samples for crush resistance from the Niobrara. I think it was like eight or nine in that size category. Um, but all those passed, passed the test. So the fine material, even though there's not as much fine material as there is medium material, the fine material we have looks like it's of pretty good quality. So that's good. Um, so, and then sorting. Uh, the more sorted means that you have more in one size category. So, for instance, a good, well sorted sand would have, you know, 80 to 90 percent in one size category and, you know, 10 percent in the other size categories. And why does that matter? Well, when you think about how they get, how they have to process the sand before they, before they distribute it to the fracking industry, if you have to spend more time sorting it, it's gonna, that ups your cost. Um, and again, so the 20 to 50 means between that 20 to 50 size range, uh, that's generally what the petroleum industry is looking for. For natural gas, they're looking for the medium to fines. They go from 40 to 140 is the smallest. It's kind of maybe opposite what you think of. The larger number is actually the smaller green size. So, of the, uh, of the ones that had 40 to 140 material, um, the sorting was pretty good, actually. In the Delta, it's around 75% um, of the samples had 80% or more. So, majority of the samples had 80% or more within that same size category. Um, and the Niobrara, over 80% of our samples had 80% or more. Does that make sense? I use two percentages at once, but I want to make sure that's clear. You said 80 for both, 170 and 75, yeah, 75 and one's above 80, yeah, yeah. Um, so then I wanted to highlight a couple areas that uh, probably had the best suited sand. Um, so the complex A, which was that most upstream, uh, the most upstream bar was the best suited bar for uh, propent. But even that was still, min uh, mineralogy was uh, suboptimal. We didn't have that high percent quartz content that you're looking at, looking for. But the roundness was good, it was really good. The sphericity was okay. Um, the, str the particle strength, like we saw, less than half of those samples in that 40 to 70 past this crush test, so that was not good. But the finer material held up pretty well. Um, and then uh, the other areas that were, that were pretty good were those uh, in the Niobrara River, the two most upstream reaches, the two that were closest to Spencer Dam. Um, they performed pretty well. The, the only issue was that, again, they weren't that high percent quartz content that they're looking for. Um, but I guess the biggest takeaway is if you were going to market this to the industry, it's definitely more of a natural gas market. Uh, petroleum industry is not probably going to be, in, there's not enough coarse material that they're looking for. So that's one thing I definitely want to highlight. All right, so uh, I guess the main takeaways are that we, know, we have the medium, mostly medium and fine grain sand, mostly medium, but there's definitely some fines in there. Um, and then the, of the material that we analyzed, uh, we definitely had that high silicate material, but not quite as much quartz as we'd like to see. Um, the crush resistance test uh, showed us that 
you're probably going to need to do a resin coating for, uh, less, I mean, the industry standards could change too, but most likely they're, they're not as strong as you would, as uh, the industry might like to see. Um, the sorting is relatively good if you're uh, talking about natural gas usage, but poor for petroleum usage. We don't really have much coarse material to look at. Um, and then as far as some additional work needed, uh, like I said when I was talking about the methods, for the samples on the Niobrara River, we're only taking two to three foot samples of sandbars. Um, it would be good to get some deep cores and see how that sand differs based uh, based on how it settles, you maybe maybe below you might have some coarser material that might not be as good. Um, and then uh, with how we did the resistivity profiles, you could do a large swath of that um, using airborne electromagnetics. Um, obviously, that's going to cost more, but you would get a better idea of where the best places to get your sand out of would be before you dredge it. Um, and then, again, I think it would be good to have s some more thorough crush resistance testing done on, on a, a higher percentage of the, the material rather than just testing it all at once. Um, I'd like to thank Army Corps of Engineers for uh, helping provide transportation and uh, um, just some general uh, advice on how to go about doing our work. and. Um, uh, again, this was funded by some USGS Midwest Region seed funding for, uh, um, for studies similar to this. Any questions? In your opinion, how sellable is the product that we come out of that? The process of doing here, the point where it's viable alternative. I think it really depends on what the market's like at the time. The point still stands for us to invest in this, like Charlie Bruce told me. People who never like money, they actually don't own money, they don't invest money. Right. So, less we can concern with this, whether or not this is worth the investment, it comes down to how much money you pay for the right size of sand, reasonable money for the gas. People love it. It's one of the things that we're looking at. Well, I think one, one thing that it might be worth uh, for MSAC looking at is uh, how much, how much is like, how much is Loop River Power Canal? Are they, how much is that providing them? Because I, but my, I mean, I think this the sand is of similar quality as what they have, so it means you're gonna have to process it and probably coat it, resin coat it. So you don't think there's a possibility that it could be not resin coated? It doesn't. It doesn't appear to be that way based on the strength test we did. Now you could, like I said, if uh, we got more money, we could do additional coring and. Um, and I, I, I want to remind you that we picked out the samples that we thought looked the best, right? So you're going to have a lot of waste material, in my opinion. So you're going to have to go through some clay and stuff like that. It's hard to get the payback, so we'll be able to sell stuff for it. That should be the problem. You get the same Right, right. Is that an almost an analysis? Yeah, we didn't. That wasn't part of this study specifically, so I can't. Get to that, I guess. Um, yeah. Did you send the results to the industry? Um, we didn't. No, no, we didn't. And part of that is because uh, we're just a science. Uh, we're just a science agency. We're just producing the results. It's publicly available to anybody. So if we were to send it to say some producer in North Dakota, that would be unfair to some producer in Texas. We're, so we're trying to be as unbiased as possible. But this group could pay that problem. Right, you, you are free to distribute the data. As, yeah, exactly, they're publicly available, so yeah. yeah. So you, you targeted your samples, if the job was good, for the whole sample. Do you have any percentage of good versus the entire sample work? Um, you know, for that, you would probably need to talk to Chris Hoxha. He's the one that did a lot of that work. Um, that wasn't part of the what I did, um, but I can definitely get you in touch with him. And what about security? So there would be a lot of ways to talk. 
might have a better uh, yeah. percentage. Yeah, I, I couldn't speak to that, sorry. I, I, I guess that the total global demand for sand is a lot larger than just the, the portion for a fraction. What caused you to focus on the fracking sand? That's a higher value sand? Um, well, and are, so. And, and, and then, are there any other follow up studies or any other papers you're looking at, potentially in other sand markets? Um, so, for the funding that we use for this particular study, it's specifically geared toward looking at frac sand sources. And that kind of got underway, like I said, about five years ago when there was a huge boom. And it's kind of died down again, but it's starting to creep back up again. Um, but as far as looking at for other markets, no, there's not any. There's no specific money looking at that right now. Nathan, uh, just jump in for a second and say uh, the USGS does have a group that's talking uh, with others around the country about what are other potential beneficial reuses of the dredged material. So it is a, a topic of study. Okay. So when you took a sample on an array of samples, what did you find in terms of the variability of the characteristics of the sand from one sandbar to the other? Uh, and the results you're putting up here, you're saying certain percentage of these samples met criteria for fracking. Did you find that from one sandbar to the next that was pretty uniform, or was there large differences depending on where you were horizontal to the delta? Um, there were definitely differences. I don't know if I would say huge differences. Uh, like I kind of pointed out at the end, that sandbar complex A uh, had better characteristics if you're looking at it from a frac sand point of view. Uh, one thing that we theorize is if you were to look further downstream in the delta, you'd have more of that finer material. That might be worth looking into because, like I said, it seemed like the finer material could hold up to the pressure a little bit better. Uh, so you might have some stronger material, and it's going to be more, even more rounded because as you transport sand, it's going to be more rounded and that kind of thing. So, so what you just said, the more rounded is stronger, so to speak. Uh, sure, yeah. And that is further downstream because it will be carried from well, the finer material will be carried yeah. further downstream. Right. Yeah. So these four deltas, uh, put them in a location in relation to the confluence of the Nile Bear. So they're just downstream the Standing Bear Bridge, if you know where that is. Okay. And Standing Bear Bridge, I think, yeah, Paul, about how many miles is that from? Mile four? Four miles. Four, four miles, miles downstream of the yeah. Okay. And these four were how far apart from beginning to end? Well, so our upstream sandbar was three and a half kilometers, so a little over a yeah, mile. Yeah, over a mile apart. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 So what's from our perspective and usage, saleability, what should our next step be based on your analysis? Um, I mean, like I said, I think talking with the Loop River Power Canal people, that might be worth look, looking into, seeing what kind of uh, benefit they're getting out of it. Is it? I mean, uh, I mean one thing to remember is, it's not like we're just dredging to sell the frac sand. We're dredging or take, using the sediment collectors like we talked about. You're using it to get rid of the sand. So if you're making any money, it's better than no money. But how much that's going to offset, that's, I mean, I think you would have to do some, we'd have to do some further study to get at that answer. But if some power for oil or gas producer is getting frac sand from some other country, for example, considering the cost of transportation, <laughs> certainly it appears it would be worth our effort 
to be in direct contact with those folks oh, based on these analysis to determine if the cost effectiveness would be worth further effort. Yes, I agree with that. Yeah. One, uh, one use of the sand, and what we're talking about, of course, is transporting the sand and sediment out of the area toward the reservoir and the, uh, and the water levels around Niagara. One use of the sand that's there now would be, obviously, to transport it below Gavin's Point Dam. Uh, currently, as everybody in this room knows, the Corps is spending, or the government, or the Department of Natural Resources, or whomever, is spending upwards of $5 million a year to transport to dredge to transport sand from a site into the river to create sandbars, uh, which support the habitat in the area that needs to be supported. Uh, that's a value of the use of this sand. And of course, it's the long-term solution, sustainable solution for the reservoir in this area, is to figure out how to retrofit the dam in a way to transport it below the dam where it can be used. It has a very valuable value. And that's something I think long-term uh, needs to be considered. And I know it's being studied by the Corps of Army Engineers. It's financially feasible to do that. It is just a matter of the will to obtain the appropriations necessary to retrofit the dam so it functions the way that dams do all over the world today when they're constructed, knowing that sediment will eventually have to be transported around and below the dam. And that's a value that needs to be taken into account when we look at our objective, which is to transport the sand out of the area. It would be great if we could sell it. We should be able to maybe find a market, let's say. But the objective is to transport it. And we can't lose sight of that being our ultimate objective as we Problems. Richard, are you suggesting flushing it? Yes, that would be a part of the analysis that uh, would be included in, in transporting the sand below Gavin's Point. You could certainly uh, retrofit the dam uh, with uh, pipes and so forth or around and, 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 and flush, uh, or frankly, I suppose you could dredge and truck. Uh, but that's an expensive, non-sustainable uh, approach. But there, there are ways to move the sediment below Gavin's point, and that's the ultimate solution that we, that we want to uh, have in mind. Do you foresee that filling the reservoir at all in order to do that? I, I really don't know. I'm not able to comment on that. But the, the use of the reservoir at its levels, uh, up and down, as you consider flushing, moving sediment, uh, like they do in China, for instance, uh, would be a part of the analysis of feasibility. It is feasible. You can ask virtually anybody. It's feasible. It's just a matter of do we want to do it now or do we want to eventually uh, remove the dam? There's no way to use One question I got is, they're shutting down the Spencer Dam, is that correct? Okay, so they won't be flushing anymore, or will they? Are they going to open it wide open? Is all the sediment going to come right? More of it going to come down the Niagara? Are they going to shut it and let it keep more upstream? What's the plan on it? Currently, it doesn't have capacity to take much more. I mean, because they had to flush it before in order to get room in there to have some hydro power. Right. Get the water in there. Yep. But they aren't they aren't going to use it anymore, isn't that correct? Right. Even, even if you don't use it, the sediment will build up until it runs actually runs over the spillways. Okay, so then so, okay. Either, that would be either way. way. Technically there probably yeah. there won't be technically any more sediment coming down the Niagara from the Spencer Dam. It, if, if the gates are left permanently open, it'll get to a point where you've got the same. same. You've got a consistent flow coming down That's instead right. of two times a year, coming down as much as they can. That's what I guess I so would that's, try. that's basically what we're understanding. Basic physics says that sediment is going to be carried by water, moving at a velocity fast enough to carry that sediment. As soon as that 
velocity is interrupted by entering still water, the sediment is going to drop out. The coarse stuff will drop out first, medium sized weight second, and last will be the final. So unless we can find a way to move that sediment through the dam, flushing is not is only going to move it from the top end to move some to the bottom end. Remember, Paul, what if we move 160,000 CFS in 2011 through at this point? And what, what percentage of that was sand? It was almost super, super clean water, zero percent. Flushing, unless we can keep the velocity going in a channel through the dam, is not going to work. It will just transport it from one part of the reservoir to another. But she might be that the dam now around the dam at a low level. I guess just in your analysis and looking at the material, um, if you could add additional additional studies for the industry, is there one that you would want to pursue first? Yeah, I hear it all about it. Uh, she asked if, uh, after looking at our data, if we were going to focus on marketing the sand to another industry, is there one that we would look at first? Um, I don't, I don't think that would be now. It, it would, I mean, if there is more industry driven, if, we're, if we see a spike in a certain industry, that, I mean, that was the driver between the frack, um, the frack sand. And, 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 I mean, in other industries, obviously, we talked about uh, using it for habitat, obviously transportation uses sand for developing aggregates and stuff like that. Um, but you know, I guess there's, answer your question simply no, I don't know one specifically. But I, I think the thing to come out of this is probably to realize that you want to look at mixed markets, so I probably wouldn't focus just on crack stands unless, again, if we hit, hit another huge North Dakota boom, maybe. But even then, there's enough there's enough frack sand resources other places that it's going to be hard to just sell it that way. So.